the weary steps of two Neanderthals. One cold, emotionless gaze watching them. Beneath the bitter cold of the Ice Age, towering figures emerge from the darkness. Each heavy step, with bodies as solid as stone columns, gripping weapons tightly, carrying with them the haunting presence of an inevitable death. A hunt begins, hunting Neanderthals. Only the dragging sound of a body remains. Somewhere in the cave, strange sounds echo. The rasping of bone, the gnashing of teeth. On the ground, beneath massive hands, beneath sharp stones, it was not wild animals, but a Neanderthal being carved up. Neanderthals are often remembered as a species that once ruled much of Europe and Asia with their brute strength and intense survival instincts. They were skilled in tool making, hunting large game, and, when necessary, even eating their own kind. Some even believed that Neanderthals hunted Homo sapiens, modern humans. But it was actually Neanderthals who became the hunted. A new human species arose, taller, with sharper intellect and flying weapons. They were true giants, not only seizing caves, food sources, and the territory of Neanderthals. They hunted, killed, and may have even eaten those remarkably similar to themselves. In the frozen earth of Europe, nearly two meter long skeletons have been found, lying sideways in caves, as if still watching a hunt that had yet to end. These were not traces of megafauna, but traces of a species. One that lived, walked, and gazed at the icy sun with deep-set eyes. Not hunched like other prehistoric humans, they stood upright, their heads held high, chests pushed forward. A posture that, if you saw anyone walking in today's crowded streets, you might not look twice. But standing next to them, you would realize how small you were, smaller in stature, smaller even in the sense of the space they filled. Their skulls were large. Inside, a brain developed to the point of excess for mere survival. High foreheads, clear chins and narrow cheekbones. Faces almost identical to ours, as if sculpted from stone and ice. They did not bow to the weather. They walked through it. Not crude, not screaming, just walking, quietly and without need for explanation. They were Cro-Magnon, the earliest Homo sapiens to exist in Europe. Not all savagery takes place in the heat of battle. Deaths come silently, neatly, with order. Like a well-practiced skinning and butchering session during a winter with nothing left to eat. At Goyet, over 40,000 years ago, Neanderthal bones were found mixed with animal bones, but bearing familiar marks, cracks from blows, to extract marrow, sharp knife cuts for butchering, and some bones even burned or ground into tools. Children, the elderly, the young, none were spared. A community that once lived together now lay as flesh in a successful hunt. Nearby, in the Le Roi cave, archaeologists discovered a piece of a Neanderthal lower jaw with an unnervingly precise cut not the mark of a wild animal's bite, but that of a stone blade, a blade once used to carve up antelopes. The hands that made those cuts were not necessarily Neanderthal. Several hundred kilometers to the north, the spy cave in Belgium tells a more ambiguous but no less chilling tale. The layers of sediment here record the coexistence of both Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons around 39,000 years ago. Some bones bear clear signs of human intervention, cuts at the knee joints, fractures at long bones, no longer the remnants of natural causes, but the result of hands that knew exactly where to strike to disassemble a body. No one can say for sure. These remains do not speak, but they whisper one thing. There was a time when Neanderthals were viewed through the eyes of a hunter, and in that moment, the species once dominant in the snow-covered forests had become mere flesh. There is no clear evidence stating that Cro-Magnons, 
ate Neanderthals is a regular practice. But there's nothing to prevent it from happening. Humans against humans has always been the primary cause of the destruction of one's own kind. In the frozen lands of Europe, Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons lived apart and seemed unaware of each other's existence. Winter dragged on. Wild animals grew scarce, forcing humans to venture further. A group of Neanderthal hunters, searching for food, unexpectedly encountered their larger neighbors, the Cro-Magnons. Instantly, the giants grew wary of the small people before them. The threat of having to share the already scarce food resources with a group that moved differently, looked different, and spoke a different language. When the stranger is so clearly different, even belonging to another species, dialogue becomes nearly impossible. For a Cro-Magnon tribe, exterminating a foreign group with no common language or signals was the simplest form of prevention against the disasters that were sure to come. Furthermore, perhaps when a small group of Neanderthals wandered into Cro-Magnon territory, they ceased to be people and became a source of protein. The two species eyed each other through the brush, and only one could survive. Cro-Magnons did not enter the world with words, but with the cuts of stone into animal bones, the dry crack of spears cutting through the air, and the wear on wooden shafts holding stone blades. In the archaeological layers of the Orignation culture, spanning from about 43,000 to 26,000 years ago, not only were tools found, but a system of weapons and tools organized like a collective brain. Bladelets, thin, long, sharp-edged knives, were crafted from pre-prepared cores of stone. In many caves from Western to Central Europe, Archaeologists found not only knives and spearheads, but also bone needles, hide alls, bird bone flutes, and traces of mobile crafting stations. Cro Magnons didn't carry tools, they carried knowledge to recreate them anywhere. The most iconic weapon was the Atlatl, the spear throwing board. A simple tool, but one that doubled the range of a spear and tripled its penetrating force, enough to kill large game or any misdirected foe from an unpredictable distance. They hunted without revealing themselves. They killed before the prey even knew they were there. From the moment the first stone blade was ground to a sharp edge, the giants didn't stand still. They grew ever larger. They began hunting even what Neanderthals needed to survive. Food sources, territory, shelter. Piece by piece, cro magnons severed the last lifeblood, sustaining the remaining Neanderthal population, pushing them into harsher regions of the Ice Age. There is a very fine line between cutting flesh to survive and cutting flesh to remember. It explains why some cuts are so precise, so symmetrical, as though someone was following a specific procedure. It explains why the skull was set aside or why certain bones were smoothed down to a point of no practical use. Elsewhere, in the ancient darkness of the Denisova cave, a human tooth was found, drilled, smooth, and worn as a pendant. It wasn't a tool, nor a leftover from a meal. It was a symbol, a sign of a ritual, an intentional act, whether to remember, to warn, or to assert something before the community. That tooth belonged to a Neanderthal, but the hands that made it, no one knows. It could have been from a fellow species. It could have been from another. What is known is that somewhere between hunting and survival, humans began creating symbols from the very flesh they had once hunted. And from that point on, life, death, and memory became one. Perhaps in the minds of our ancestors, Neanderthals were not just enemies, but symbols. Something that needed to be killed, divided, and resolved, not just with blood, but with ritualistic actions. You don't need gods for rituals, just a community, a death and a way to handle the corpse, unlike any ordinary day.
a pair of eyes staring at another species, both familiar and foreign, then deciding to make them something to consume, to assimilate, perhaps to assert victory, perhaps to erase their trace, or perhaps, simply, to make sure no one would ever speak of them again. And if that is true, if eating Neanderthals became a repeated, organized act, passed down through collective memory, then we are not just facing survival instincts, but a ritual from the Ice Age, carried out with sharp stone, dwindling fire, and the final silence. Though much remains uncertain, increasing evidence suggests that Cro-Magnon regarded Neanderthals as a living source of protein. In a world of ice, where life was as fragile as dew, Cro-Magnon placed their instincts above all to survive. And when Neanderthals went extinct around 30,000 years ago, their final footprints melted into the darkness of history, while Cro-Magnon survived to become us today. Cro-Magnon were not demons. They were survival instincts awakened in desperation. And history, as it always is, is written by the survivors. You may reject the past, but you cannot deny the bloodline flowing through your veins. The question is not, where do we come from? But, if pushed into the icy despair of our ancestors, what would we do? Hold on to our humanity, or abandon it to survive one more day?